Okay, uh, tonight's first lecture is psychiatric emergencies. Uh, we see a lot of this uh, play out in other things that we've talked about. Um, and we also are seeing uh, EMS really becoming the first line uh, interventions for uh, the uh, people with psychiatric illnesses. Um, part of that is a large part of our uh, psychiatric, uh, those that struggle with psychiatric emergencies uh, have some other behavioral or psychosocial issues, so we as EMS providers often are their only access to health care. Um, we see a large portion of our homeless and uh, those uh, who live in poverty struggle uh, more so than others with psychiatric issues, so we do uh, uh, struggle uh, a little bit more with uh, seeing those people. Uh, Jake, uh, Travis sent me an email. Uh, I wasn't going to include you uh, on our attendance, but uh, I will tell them that you were here. Uh, Jake, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I believe is joining us all the way from Saipan. Uh, he's an EMT over there and uh, our EMS outreach at Sanford and Travis specifically has been instructing EMT courses in Saipan uh, in his free time. So Jake is a firefighter, uh, I believe, and an EMT from Saipan and he's joining our class tonight for some continuing education credits. Um, so Jake, I will make sure that uh, I note that you are here. Um, so, uh, psychiatric emergencies can uh, be uh, a result of many different things. Um, we see changes in behavior in acute medical situations. Uh, we also deal a lot with mental illness. One of the things that we will see most often when it comes to psychiatric emergencies or psychiatric emergencies that are caused by mind-altering substances or drugs. Um, a big portion of this uh, is often caused by stress uh, and some other, th I mean really there are just too many things to list. Uh, and talk about all in this lecture. One of the big things that we worry about as first responders is dealing with uh, our stress. Um, we, we, uh, for those of you who uh, maybe uh, have done this for a while in some capacity or a, another, uh, maybe as a police officer or firefighter or something, um, being exposed to the type of stress that we deal with on a daily basis uh, is really uh, something that opens up first responders for psychiatric problems. It's one of the uh, most pressing issues in our uh, profession right now, and we're starting to see a lot of good research and resources being developed to deal with our own uh, psychiatric uh, issues and our own behavioral health as well. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about myths and reality here. Uh, keep in mind that at some point in our lives, uh, pretty much all of us experience some sort of an emotional crisis. This, this does not mean that everyone develops mental illness, okay? Um, it's just like any other medical problem. It can happen to us once and we, it doesn't mean that we develop some sort of uh, long-term illness from it. Otherwise, healthy people may sustain uh, acute or temporary mental health disorders. Uh, the biggest thing that we need to remember as first responders is not to jump to the conclusion that a patient is mentally ill uh, when they exhibit some sort of emotional distress. <clears throat> 
Okay, there's there's a big difference between an emotional crisis and somebody who is truly mental Ill, mentally ill. Okay, common misconceptions about mental illness is that if you are feeling bad or depressed, you must be sick. Uh, that's not the case. We all have bad days, and it's okay to be angry or frustrated. Uh, some of the more common causes of uh, rough days or depression that exceeds the ability for us to uh, internalize and handle uh, big stresses such as a divorce, loss of a job, death of a relative or a friend. Most of us can handle uh, a work deadline or a bad grade or um, poor drivers, especially in this weather. You know, we have the ability to uh, deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis without it extending for an extended period of time. When we start getting in depressed states, uh, the ability to deal with the issue extends beyond a reasonable time frame and it starts affecting your entire life. So uh, these are big things such as divorce, loss of a job. Um, it's not just something that you can deal with, it's something that uh, you need to take time and work your way through. Uh, many people believe that all individuals with mental health disorders are dangerous or violent or otherwise uh, unmanageable. Um, that number may be skewed, especially working in EMS, because chances are we are going to be dealing with the people who are dangerous, violent, or otherwise unmanageable. We don't see the people who deal with their mental illness uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Generally, we interact with with people when uh, their illness has progressed to a level where they can no longer manage it and they need to actually seek uh, intensive uh, therapy and acute care. Only a small percentage of people with mental health problems uh, fall into the categories of being dangerous, violent, or unmanageable. Keep in mind that uh, when dealing with somebody that is going through an emotional crisis or a psych psychiatric emergency, that communication is key. Uh, maintaining a calm, reassuring tone can uh, often help de-escalate the situation. Although you can't determine uh, what has caused a person's crisis, you may uh, be able to predict whether the person will become violent. So. Um, Keep in mind that uh, sometimes all of these people uh, need is uh, somebody to talk to, and as a first responder, you're going to have uh, some time to interact with those people, especially uh, when you're transporting them to a facility or something like that. Um, just talking and listening and letting them uh, express themselves goes a long ways. Uh, the thing that we always want to be sure of is that we are never escalating the situation. Um, we've all seen people out there who take uh, advantage of the mentally ill, um, or we see people who kind of uh, feed into the anger or the issue that is at hand. Uh, as an EMS provider or healthcare professional, we always want to be the calming, uh, level-headed force. We never want to uh, ramp up a situation. We always want to try and diffuse it. So just talk to your patients. Uh, a lot of times these patients don't need medical interventions. They don't need assessments or medicines or anything like that. They just need to have a conversation. Um, while doing so, always make sure that you are evaluating your situation for any possible violence. Okay, remember, scene safety is something that is always continuous from the time that you uh, arrive at the patient's, uh, or basically from the time you're dispatched until the time you drop a patient off at the hospital. You always need to be constantly evaluating your safety.
Uh, never get to a point where uh, you are isolated. Okay, never get backed into a corner. Always have an escape route. Um, watch the patient's uh, personal space. Okay, if you're not within uh, striking distance, uh, you'll still always have uh, a means to escape. So uh, just be aware of your situation. That's one of the big keys of this lecture. Okay, so uh, the definition of a behavioral crisis, uh, behavior is what you can see of a person's response to the environment, so his or her actions. Over time, people develop various coping mechanisms for dealing with uh, stressful situations in a healthy manner. Sometimes uh, this stress becomes overwhelming and the normal ways of coping are not enough or the person uses negative coping mechanisms, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, social abnormalities, etc. Reaction to stress can be acute or develop over time. So this can be something that comes on very suddenly or it's a buildup until uh, the stress becomes uh, at a level that they are unable to deal with it. Uh, this is generally where we get in, uh, involved as EMS providers. Uh, family or uh, the public notices a change in behavior which is uh, not normal or inappropriate for the person and uh, they call 911 to seek some sort of medical assistance. Okay, a uh, behavioral crisis or psychiatric emergency may involve patients of all ages. Uh, so this is not something that is limited to a specific age group or a specific sex. Um, we can deal with uh, behavioral crisis or psychiatric emergencies uh, from very young to very old. Uh, these patients uh, generally display some sort of of agitation, uh, they could be violent or uncooperative behavior. Usually if an abnormal or disturbing uh, pattern of behavior lasts for a month or more, it is a matter of concern uh, from a mental health standpoint. When a psychiatric emergency arises, the patient may show agitation or violence and become a threat to uh, self or others. Okay, uh, mental health disorders, uh, not a lot of research, not a lot of focus uh, traditionally has been put on mental health disorders as we kind of are evolving as a society and as a healthcare system. We're starting to finally understand the importance of mental health and uh, unfortunately we are really behind the eight ball as far as uh, having resources and the ability to provide treatment to these patients. So some common uh, psychiatric disorders that uh, we run into, anxiety disorders. Um, this is your generalized anxiety. Uh, so somebody gets uh, anxious uh, for whatever reason. Maybe it's justified, maybe it's unjustified. Okay. Uh, a panic disorder is the next step after an anxiety disorder. Okay, generally anxiety, you feel uneasy about something, uh, you don't uh, uh, feel good about uh, whatever you're going through or whatever you're about to do. A panic disorder is when that anxiety extends and you start having some uh, physiological responses. You start to panic, hyperventilate, uh, your heart rate increases. Okay, so it's uh, the next step after an anxiety disorder. Uh, 
Um, we also see uh, social and other phobias, uh, whether this is obsessive compulsive, whether this is uh, social disorders like ADHD, uh, those sorts of things. We see post-traumatic stress disorders, and uh, like I've already talked a little bit about the impulse obsessive compulsive those are your anxiety disorders okay this uh, slide likes to talk about all the great uh, mental health systems that are uh, provided in the US that if you do any research on this topic you will note that um, we are really lacking in this field However, uh, the types of assistance that people will generally find are professional counselors. Um, counselors are available from everything from marital conflicts to parenting issues. Um, the next uh, step uh, we have are our uh, psychologists. These are the people that handle uh, more serious issues such as depression, uh, suicidal ide ideations, those sorts of things. The most intensive uh, therapy uh, that we can have, these are for our patients that have severe psychological conditions such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, and those patients are going to be seen by psychiatrists. Uh, psychiatrists are the only mental health professionals that have the ability to prescribe medications. Uh, unlike most other medical conditions, uh, psychological disorders are generally handled through outpatient visits. Okay, uh, we generally save uh, inpatient treatment for those uh, larger issues such as schizophrenia and bipolar. Um, those larger issues sometimes require uh, inpatient hospitalization. Uh, that generally occurs in psychiatric units. Okay, psychiatric disorders uh, have many underlying causes. Sometimes it's due to a stress, such as a social situation or uh, divorce, death of a loved one. It can also be caused uh, by diseases, such as schizophrenia. We can also see uh, psychiatric disorders due to an illness, such as a diabetic emergency. Okay, uh, anytime uh, that there is a change in our level of consciousness, it has the ability to present like a psychiatric emergency. Uh, the main problems that we deal with uh, are the mind-altering substances such as alcohol or drug use. And then finally, uh, we can see some psychiatric issues caused by electrical light, electric electrolyte imbalances can't say that word today um, so chemicals in your body uh, get out of whack which also can mess uh, with your mind a little bit and cause uh, some conditions that mimic uh, signs of a mental health disorder Keep in mind, just like any other condition, it is not your responsibility as an EMT for diagnosing uh, any underlying cause or any specific uh, mental health disorder. Rather, uh, our job is to uh, treat and provide care for any signs and symptoms that that patient may have. There are generally two different um, diagnoses of uh, psychiatric emergencies. Uh, you have your organic brain syndromes. 
This is a temporary or permanent dysfunction of the brain caused by a disturbance in the physical or physiological function of the brain tissue. So in an organic disorder, there is something wrong with the brain itself. It has physically changed and therefore uh, your patient develops some sort of behavioral issue. Um, some examples of organic disorders, uh, sudden illness, traumatic uh, brain injury, seizure disorders, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, diseases of the brain such as Alzheimer's or meningitis. Okay, so with an organic uh, s disorder, there is something actually uh, physically wrong with the brain and the brain tissue. Okay, functional disorders, uh, it's a it's a physiological disorder that impairs the bodily uh, function when the body seems to be structurally normal. So these are uh, your functional disorders are your disorders that are uh, are really unexplained. Uh, the structure of the brain is is normal but there is some behavioral disorder that doesn't allow the patient to behave normally. Uh, these are your schizophrenias, your anxiety conditions, and your depression. Okay, um, so how do we deal with patients with a uh, behavioral emergency? Keep in mind that we're going to use all of our regular skills. Uh, however, there are going to be other management techniques like I talked about at the beginning a lot of the times these patients don't need a medicine they don't need a procedure all they need is somebody to talk to but we still need to do all of our normal stuff before we arrive at that point so the biggest thing uh, is seen size up the first thing uh, to consider when you're dispatched uh, and when you arrive on scene is to observe the environment around you. Make sure that you take uh, any standard precautions and request any additional resources that you may need. Uh, obviously, uh, anytime you're going to a some sort of behavioral disorder, uh, you're always going to want to get law enforcement started. You can always cancel them but you never really want to enter one of these scenes on your own. You want to make sure that you have uh, the experts there who can deal with somebody that has a behavioral disorder. So uh, always keep in mind that uh, when you're going to a behavioral problem, uh, it's always good to uh, request law enforcement uh, prior to you actually arriving on the scene. Okay, so uh, after we do uh, our scene safety, we need to proceed with our scene size up a little bit. Uh, we need to try and come up with a mechanism of injury or nature of illness. Uh, we want to note any medications or substances that may contribute to the complaint or that may be uh, uh, kind of adding into the situation here. So, uh, you know, when you're determining the nature of illness, you really want to figure out, okay, is this something that the patient has been struggling with their entire life, or is this something that is being caused by uh, some acute situation that I need to try and figure out? Okay, just like any other patient, we're going to form uh, a general impression Begin your assessment uh, from a distance, okay? Don't just rush into the scene and uh, run right over to the patient, okay? You always want to approach these types of patients with uh, a guarded uh, kind of manner, making sure that you always have an escape route. <clears throat> uh, you want to perform a... Uh, Initial primary assessment, um, look for any signs of trauma, observe the patient's uh, behavior closely, 
One of the big things that you can really do uh, that's probably more important with these patients more so than any other type of patient that we deal with is try and establish a good rapport with the patient, build some trust. Um, these will, uh, or this will help you further on down the road. It'll make your life a lot easier as you transport this patient to the hospital. Um, if you violate that trust with the patient, uh, things can not only be much harder, but they can also get dangerous for you. Uh, so you always want to try and earn the patient's trust. And this goes back to that whole thing where we really are the mediator. We are, we always want to stay the, the people that everybody likes. Okay. Uh, because that will just allow us to operate more safely. Our primary assessment is just like any other patient. Uh, we need to determine our patient's level of consciousness. We need to open the airway uh, and assess their airway for patency and effective breathing. You also need to evaluate the patient's uh, circulation. If they have a problem with their level of consciousness, their airway, breathing, or circulation, their ABCs, we're going to transport them emergently. Um, generally, most uh, psychological issues or behavioral emergencies aren't uh, critical in nature, so they don't generally affect uh, airway, breathing, and circulation. So generally, we're going to be staying on scene and doing uh, a further assessment. However, just like with any other patient, if you do have a problem in that primary assessment, you need to load and go to the hospital. It's very important to uh, investigate the chief complaint. We want to uh, consider uh, some uh, possible contributing factors if a patient is not acting themselves or uh, is uh, not of sound mind. We need to evaluate whether or not the patient is having a problem with their central nervous system. Okay, is this a stroke? Is this a brain bleed that is changing the uh, patient's behavior? Are there any mind-altering substances such as uh, drugs and alcohol? And if the answer is no to both of those, then we need to try and establish why uh, we're here today. What is going on that made this patient uh, suddenly have this behavioral emergency? Is there a significant life change uh, such as um, stress, divorce, loss of work? Okay, are there any other things that may be contributing to this uh, change today? Okay, after we uh, evaluate and understand our chief complaint, we'll move into our sample history. Um, you want to, uh, in addition to what you would normally ask, you want to ask about uh, any previous episodes, treatments, or hospitalizations due to a behavioral problem, any medications uh, that the patient takes to stabilize their mood. Keep in mind that in geriatric patients, we need to consider uh, neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's or dementia. Try and talk to the family and identify the patient's baseline mental status. Okay, is this normal for them? Has this occurred before or is this completely out of left field? If it's completely out of left field, you need to start thinking about uh, big, bad, and ugly things like a head bleed or uh, other medical problems such as uh, a low blood sugar that could be mimicking the effects of these behavioral problems. Chances are uh, people don't just have a mental breakdown for no reason. Okay, Either it can be explained due to some stressful event or previous history if it's completely out of left field, you need to start thinking about, okay, maybe there's something else going on here. 
Okay, so these are uh, some questions that you can ask yourself or you can ask uh, bystanders or family to help kind of evaluate uh, what is going on and gain some insight. Okay, a secondary assessment in a uh, patient who uh, is unconscious is very key. You have to uh, try and figure out, uh, are, is there anything that could be causing uh, their altered mental status or their unconsciousness? You need to rule out trauma, especially to the head. Consider whether uh, or not prior events such as physical agitation, use of stimulants, alcohol, or withdrawal symptoms um, may be contributing to the patient. Uh, you can look for other physical uh, signs while you're doing your head to toe, such as track marks um, or signs of self-mutilation. Uh, I'll give you a uh, story to kind of uh, stress the importance of doing a head-to-toe. Um, I was a new paramedic. Uh, we got dispatched uh, to a reported assault at a residence. Um, we got there. There was, uh, you know, kind of a, a less than... Uh, productive member of our society there. Uh, the guy had admitted to drinking. He got into a fight with one of his buddies. Uh, it, it was evident that he, you know, kind of lived on the streets. He had really kind of uh, this long uh, hair and was really kind of unkept. So we got there and the guy was, uh, you know, being uncooperative, kind of in an argument with law enforcement. Uh, they wanted us to take him to the hospital because, you know, he was acting drunk and uh, just kind of being a knucklehead. So, uh, you know, he didn't want to go to the hospital, so the cops ended up, you know, forcing him into the back of the ambulance, so he was pissed off at us. And, you know, it's the middle of the night, and, uh, you know, I just want to go back to bed at this point. So we drive this guy into the hospital. I kind of, you know, do the minimums. I check a set of vital signs. I check his blood sugar. Um, and, you know, just kind of tell him to sit on the bed and, you know, stop yelling. And we'll be at the hospital in a little bit. So we go in. We drop this guy off at the hospital. And, uh... You know, he had been in an altercation, so he had, you know, some cuts and scrapes and some some blood and, uh, you know, nothing serious. So we drop him off at the hospital. And we go back, uh, go to bed for a little bit, run another call, and uh, we end up back at the hospital again. We walk in, and uh, the trauma room where we had put this guy is, like, completely destroyed. I mean, there's, like, uh, equipment everywhere, and, uh, you know, you could tell that something major had happened in, in this room. So uh, we drop off our patient, and I'm like, what, what the hell happened in there? Well, apparently, this guy uh, was in a fight. He was drunk, but during this fight, he got hit in the head with a golf club, and the golf club actually penetrated his skull and, like, uh, left a giant hole in his head. Um, due to his matted, nasty hair, he didn't really bleed that much. So basically, by me not doing a good thorough secondary assessment and passing this guy off as just a drunk, I missed the guy with the golf club uh, size hole in his head. Needless to say, that was uh, a little embarrassing from uh, my perspective. You know, it was crazy. He was awake talking. You know, he shouldn't have been 
any of those sorts of things. So he had no actual physical signs that uh, he was that injured. So it's not like I didn't do anything for him. But um, he ended up declining shortly after he got to the hospital and, and was very sick. So uh, just one of those key stories about how you can never uh, necessarily dismiss somebody uh, as just being drunk or just uh, having uh, a behavioral emergency. You really need to do a secondary assessment on every patient because you never know uh, what truly happened and you don't want to be the person who misses uh, the guy with the giant hole in the side of his head. So uh, just keep that story in the back of your mind. And I generally share that with every class at some uh, point in time to stress the importance of doing a secondary assessment and always putting your hands uh, on your patient and checking every part of their body. Um, so a little bit... Uh, there are some things that uh, we can evaluate a little bit differently uh, when it comes to a behavioral emergency. Uh, we need to kind of evaluate our patient's emotional state. Uh, we don't generally do this on uh, other types of calls, but we can evaluate their facial expression, their pulse rate, and their respirations. Okay, that will uh, give you some insight on how they are generally feeling. Okay, so if you have somebody standing there with a blank look, you know, not acknowledging you, not participating uh, in any of the exam, but you go and you feel their pulse and it's, you know, 120 and they're breathing 30 times a minute, well, chances are you know that something is wrong, that they're just not blank-faced, okay? So you can use those vital signs to, to help you establish some sort of emotional state of your patient. Other things that you want to take note of, tears, sweating, um, a blank gaze or rapidly moving eye movements uh, may clue you into some sort of central nervous system problem. So you really just need to evaluate your patient as a whole. If you are transporting somebody in a true uh, behavioral crisis, you never want to be alone in the back of the ambulance. So if possible, uh, have a firefighter or a law enforcement personnel uh, trans uh, ride in the back of the ambulance with you. Make sure that you always position yourself um, in a manner that you can get out of uh, the ambulance there may be a specific facility to which the patients uh, with psychiatric emergencies are transported. In this region, we don't buy uh, anybody that calls 911 uh, and wants to be transported to the hospital. They get transported to an emergency department. We don't directly take uh, patients to a psychiatric facility. Uh, so generally, if you're going to be dealing with these patients, you're going to take them to your local ER. Um... Transport patients by ground. Uh, this one seems kind of obvious. Um, generally, patients with psychiatric problems don't meet criteria for air transport. If for some reason there was a need to transfer this patient uh, via critical care transport, generally what we do is we would uh, basically make the patient unconscious uh, put in an airway and uh, sedate the patient for the entire transport. So we would basically RSI them or rapid sequence intubation. So we'd give them drugs, put the patient to sleep, and then we would transport them in a uh, unconscious state in the helicopter. Uh, very rarely do we come across true psychiatric problems that would need to be flown. Generally, this is only done in patients like with an overdose or patients with some other sort of trauma. But uh, for obvious reasons, we never take anybody who is combative in an aircraft with us. <laughs>
So like I talked about, uh, always constantly reevaluate your situation, never let your guard down. Um, if we did, have we talked about restraints uh, before? Was that in another section? Okay, um, so remember, uh, with restraints, if you are transporting somebody uh, who is restrained, you need to reassess and document those restraints every five minutes. So just like any other intervention that you do, or any other um, splint uh, or restrictive device that you apply, you need to reassess uh, the distal circulation sensation and movement every five minutes. So if your patient's in handcuffs, you need to assess uh, their cap refill, the ability for them to move and feel with their hands distal uh, to the restraints every five minutes. Uh, that's just to make sure that they have adequate blood flow. Remember that our job is to diffuse and control the situation. Uh, we are not the police, so we only intervene as much as it takes to accomplish these tasks. Uh, EMS providers should not be uh, physically restraining patients. You should not be uh, assisting police officers and placing somebody in custody. Okay, all of those things just open you up to uh, legal uh, prosecution. If uh, your patient is uh, agitated to the point where you think they need a pharmacological restraint, uh, this would be some sort of medicine to calm them down and uh, keep them compliant. Uh, that can be provided by ALS providers or critical care providers. Basically, uh, we would give them medicine to, uh, to relax them and then monitor their airway uh, throughout transport, but that's only done at the advanced levels. It's important that you communicate uh, the um, that you are transporting a patient with a psychiatric emergency, okay? So that the hospital can get their resources uh, lined up, they can find an appropriate area to put this patient, and make sure that they're not placing any other patients uh, in danger. And then you always want to make sure that you're documenting uh, thoroughly and carefully in these situations, especially if restraints are uh, applied or if you are transporting somebody under the order of law enforcement uh, against their will. So that was kind of uh, dealing with uh, some of the anxiety issues. We'll talk a little bit about acute psychosis now. I'm not sure why they are any different uh, as far as treatment goes, but the book splits them up here a little bit. So uh, psychosis is a state of delusion in which the person is out of touch with reality. Uh, people who are experiencing psychosis live in their own reality of ideas and feelings, and generally this causes some sort of psychotic episode. So schizophrenia, it's a complex disorder that is not easily defined or treated. Remember, uh, with schizophrenia, there is no actual structural problem. Uh, with the brain, it's something, it's a disorder that just comes from somewhere else. We don't have a really good understanding of where. Uh, typically, schizophrenia uh, occurs in early adulthood. So anywhere from uh, your mid-teens to your mid-20s is generally where we see schizophrenia uh, start to develop. 
And schizophrenia is one of those things where it does kind of come out of nowhere. Remember I told you earlier that if it's uh, an acute onset, uh, that they don't have a history of it, you really need to start thinking of a medical problem. Well, schizophrenia is one of those things uh, that is kind of contrary to that in that it does kind of come out of nowhere, especially that initial episode. Um, people just really have a mental break and uh, they start going into a state that where they have these delusions, hallucinations, uh, and you also see them uh, really with erratic speech. These are people who really uh, are hard to tell if they have ingested something or if they are really having an acute onset of schizophrenia. They are really close. So if you go to somebody and the family says, I think they're high on something, but the patient just tells you, no, there's nothing wrong with me, I didn't take anything, uh, and they are kind of having these signs and symptoms, then we really need to uh, generally start thinking about uh, an acute onset of schizophrenia. So some general guidelines for dealing with a psychotic patient. Determine if the situation is dangerous. Identify yourself. Be calm, direct, and straightforward. Maintain emotional distance and do not argue with the patient. Okay, try and diffuse the situation. Never escalate and try and make it worse. Dealing with anybody uh, in a behavioral crisis, we always want to explain what we would like to do before we do it. Uh, this helps build that rapport with the patient, establishes trust. Uh, anytime you do something suddenly or catch patients with psychiatric illnesses off guard, that's really when you can start to see a problem and kind of get into that uh, environment where they can become violent or uh, lose trust in you. If uh, you're able, involve people with whom the patients trust, uh, such as a family or friend. Uh, this also helps build that rapport uh, and helps gain the patient's cooperation. Okay, delirium is a condition of impairment in which cognitive function that can present with disorientation, hallucinations, or delusion. Agitation is a behavior characterized by restless and irregular physical activity. So some symptoms of excited delirium, hyperactive, irrational behavior, vivid hallucinations, hypertension, di tachycardia, diaphoresis, and dilated pupils. Now, of all the things that we have talked about, none of them are truly a life-threatening medical uh, condition except for excited delirium okay excited delirium uh, is a true medical condition because it extends beyond a psychological issue and you start having uh, physiological issues most of the time when we see excited delirium it's secondary to some uh, mind altering substances uh, you see this a lot with methamphetamine, you see it with other uh, hallucinogens like LSD, gypsum weed, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, you start to see patients get into excited delirium. And because they have these physiological reactions, it really does turn into a true medical emergency that needs to be managed as well. Um, if your patient has uncontrolled hypertension, uh, we see people work themselves up to a point where they have strokes. Uh, if the tachycardia is not controlled, uh, we've seen uh, patients put so much stress on their heart that they actually trigger a MI. So excited delirium is the true medical emergency of uh, the psychological illnesses. So it's important that we be calm, supportive, and empathetic, approach the patient slowly, limit physical contact, and do not leave the patient unattended. So if we have a patient who is truly in excited delirium based on these signs and symptoms, 
you really need to try and bring that patient under control and calm them down. If you fail to calm them down, it can actually lead to medical problems. Um, observe the patient's ability to communicate. Uh, if the patient has overdosed, take all medication bottles or legal substances to uh, the medical facility. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that bullet point. If it's medication, okay. Uh, please do not uh, bring illegal substances like methamphetamine or any of those things into your medical facility. Leave those on scene for law enforcement to handle. Okay, um, if the patient's agitation continues and you are not able to bring them under control, this is a situation where ALS uh, assistance is required so that we can chemically restrain those patients and bring them into a uh, physiological state in which they are no longer a danger to their medical uh, condition. So uh, basically we need to give them meds to reverse their high blood pressure and their uncontrolled tachycardia. Okay, I know we've already talked about restraints, but we'll uh, hit over this again. Um, every service should have a protocol uh, that allows uh, for application of restraints and dictates their use. Okay, depending on where you work, those protocols are going to uh, vary widely. Anytime you are restraining somebody, uh, you should always be choosing the least restrictive option that ensures the safety of the patients and providers. Okay, so if you only need to restrain somebody's upper extremities, uh, then that's where you should restrain them. You don't need to restrain them at their feet and at their chest and, and everywhere else, okay? So we're only doing uh, what is minimally necessary to gain compliance. Personnel must be properly trained. If you restrain a person uh, without authority in a non-emergency situation, you obviously open yourself up to uh, litigation. Uh, this can include assault, uh, false imprisonment, and a basic violation of civil rights. In EMS, you may only use restraints to protect yourselves or others from bodily harm. Okay, so this is the big key. Uh, if you're applying restraints, it must be done to protect yourself or others from an immediate bodily harm. Um, or this is more of a judgment call if you determine that the patient is a threat or has the possibility of injuring him or herself. Okay, as a general rule of thumb, anytime you are applying restraints, you need to involve law enforcement. Um, obviously, before considering physical restraint, you need to use uh, good verbal uh, de-escalation techniques, and you need to try and de-escalate the situation to the best of your abilities. If at that point the patient is still a danger to you or a danger to the public or themselves, then you can, uh, can seriously consider uh, possible restraints. Okay, I'm not going to t uh, lecture too much on how to apply restraints because um, I'm not legally going to be responsible for teaching you how to do this. Each service is going to have uh, their own training and own um, kind of acceptable time and way to do it. Just keep in mind that you should use the minimum force necessary. You should have a proper number of people. Um, if you're applying force to a patient, you should really be considering what you're doing. And uh, the better option would be to back out of that situation and let law enforcement handle it. Okay, the only time you should be uh, applying force to a patient 
is to remove yourself or your partner from a dangerous situation. Even if we are applying restraints, we need to treat the patient with dignity and respect. If possible, uh, a provider of the same gender should attend to the patient. So uh, if it's a male patient in the back who is restrained, uh, male caregivers should be in the back if uh, possible. And make sure you're wearing appropriate barrier protection. Uh, keep in mind that uh, patients who are uh, physically violent have the tendency to spit. Uh, so make sure that you are accounting for uh, increased uh, substance isolation as well. Keep in mind that uh, we, we will never leave a restrained person unattended. Okay, uh, four point restraints are generally preferred and monitor the patient closely. You will never restrain a patient in the prone position. Uh, we've already talked about this, but you, anytime you apply restraints, uh, you will apply them to a patient who is laying face up. You will never restrain a patient face down. If you are transporting a patient who is in handcuffs, uh, you must have uh, a way to remove those handcuffs in an emergent situation. So either that means the police are riding with you in the ambulance or they are within direct eyesight of the ambulance at all times to remove the restraints if there is an emergency. So violent patients, only a small portion, but remember we may see a, an increased portion based on what we do. We need to be alert for signs of potential violence. Okay, some of the things that we can evaluate, does this patient have a history of aggressive or violent behavior? Evaluate the patient's posture. How is the patient sitting or standing? Is the patient tense, rigid, sitting on the edge of his or her seat? Okay, if the patient is in a position where they can make a quick move, you need to increase your defensible space. If the patient is relaxed and not sitting in or acting in a way that is uh, threatening, then you can kind of cut down on that space because you will have more time to react. Um, evaluate the scene. Is the patient holding uh, or near a potentially lethal object? Okay, remember a lethal object can really be anything of blunt or penetrating nature. Uh, vocal activity. Is the patient uh, threatening? Are they uh, being loud, obscene, and erratic? Okay, uh, if your patient is being threatening, you want to remove yourself from that situation and allow those who uh, are trained to uh, deal with it. Obviously, uh, the physical activity is the most telling factor of all. Okay, anybody who has tense muscles, clenched fists, uh, pacing, cannot sit still, uh, protecting their personal space. Okay, uh, these are really the people that you need to be concerned about and make sure that you aren't in uh, the space where they can uh, physically harm you in a quick manner. Other things uh, to consider uh, a potentially violent uh, patient, poor impulse control, history of substance abuse, or a functional disorder. Okay. So moving away from uh, potential violent acts and talking about suicide or uh, self-harm. Um, depression is the single most significant factor that contributes to suicide. Uh, it is a myth that people who threaten suicide uh, never commit suicide. If somebody is threatening suicide, uh, you need to take that as a clear indication that someone is in crisis. That person cannot be left alone. Okay, some common warning signs of suicide. Uh, 
air of cheerfulness, sadness, deep despair, or hopelessness. Uh, somebody that is detached from uh, their life or situation. Inability to talk about the future. Anybody who has a suggestion of suicide or anybody that has uh, plans related to their death. That's very unnormal. Okay, uh, this table talks about uh, more risk factors for suicide. You can find that in your book. Uh, depression, obviously the main uh, key. Anybody who has a previous suicide attempt obviously has an increased risk factor. Specific plan, family history, uh, people who are older than 40, uh, especially if they are single, widowed, divorced, recent loss of a spouse, financial setbacks, alcohol or substance abuse. Okay, all risk factors for suicide. Um, additional things that you need to consider, are there any unsafe objects nearby? Is the environment unsafe? Is there any evidence of self-destructive or self-mutilation behavior? Is there an imminent threat to the patient or others? Okay, are there cultural or religious beliefs promoting suicide? Has there been any trauma? Uh, keep in mind that a suicidal patient may be homicidal as well, so anytime you are dealing with a suicidal patient, you need to have an increased uh, sense of personal safety, and you should have law enforcement uh, close or nearby. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, this occurs after exposure to or injury from a traumatic event. Okay, an estimated uh, 7 to 8 percent of the general population will experience PTSD at some point in their lives. Military personnel with combat experience have a high incident rate, as do first responders. First responders, we don't have post-traumatic stress disorder, we have chronic stress disorder. Uh, just think that uh, PTSD stems from uh, going through a traumatic event and not being able to deal with it afterwards. Think of the impact on first responders who are constantly exposed to, to, to traumatic events, uh, one after another. Um, so this is really something that not only is it something that we're talking about from a treatment standpoint, but it's something that you need to be aware of for your own self uh, health as well. Okay, symptoms of PTSD include feelings of helplessness, anxiety, anger, or fear. Um, these people may avoid reminders of the trauma, um, can relive the traumatic events through thoughts, nightmares, and flashbacks. Um, we see a lot of people with PTSD struggle with heart rate uh, or their uh, blood pressure. Um, as a result of constantly uh, living with this high level of stress. This can uh, lead to an increased risk of suicide. Although this is talking about combat veterans, uh, like I said, this really is for anybody who has sustained this level of trauma. Um, Things that can be related, traumatic brain injuries or other, uh, other physiological conditions can increase the likelihood of dealing with uh, some sort of post-traumatic stress. Okay, be careful. Uh, this requires a unique level of understanding. Make sure you are careful of how you phrase your questions. Use a calm, firm voice, but make sure you're in charge. Respect the person's personal space. Try and limit the number of uh, people involved. And the main thing that we worry about with PTSD is any suicidal ideations.
Okay, we want to make sure that anytime we are on scene, uh, that we are not uh, allowing these patients access to any weapons or anything that can be used as a weapon. And remember that physical restraints may uh, escalate the problem, so make sure that you are uh, taking uh, good, sound uh, precautions when dealing with these sorts of situations. So talking about some legal considerations, um, there are going to be times where you must decide whether the patient needs immediate medical care. The patient may re resist your attempt to provide care. Um, remember that if the patient is a threat to himself or to the public, that uh, we have to intervene. We cannot leave that patient alone. Remember that uh, if we feel that the patient is unable to make adequate medical decisions for themselves, that we need to request law enforcement uh, to uh, possibly evaluate that patient and remove their abilities to refuse care. Okay. Implied consent is assumed with a patient who is not mentally competent to grant consent. So if for some reason your patient is altered or unconscious, we can go ahead and proceed under implied consent. Remember with consent, if at any point you are not sure, always request the assistance of law enforcement for guidance and allow them to make the decision for you. Okay, as EMS providers, we have a limited legal authority to require a patient to undergo uh, medical care when no life-threatening emergency exists. Remember that competent adults have the right to refuse care. If for some reason you feel that the patient is not making uh, a legal decision for themselves or you are concerned that they are... Um, could be impaired, you need to make sure that you are uh, contacting law enforcement to get their opinion on it. Okay, keep in mind that a patient who is impaired may not be considered uh, competent. Um, so if a patient is under the influences of drugs or alcohol, they don't have the ability to provide uh, consent for themselves. They also do not have the ability to refuse medical care. Always err on the side of treatment and transport uh, if you're not sure. If you need additional uh, help to make that decision, make sure you are reaching out for those resources. Okay, um, a behavioral crisis is most accurately defined as, these are hard to answer, so uh, I'm just going to skip because there's so much uh, writing on this page. Um, the answer is actually B, so a behavioral crisis is most accurately defined as any reaction to events that interferes with activities of daily living or has become unacceptable to the patient, family, or community. Remember, uh, on my exams, you generally won't see these definitions. You'll see this applied in a more practical setting, so we'll give you a patient and we'll want you to perform the right steps. Um, you won't see questions that asks for definitions uh, on the National Registry. Okay, depression and schizophrenia are examples of, so remember there are two types of uh, illness when we think about uh, psychological problems. 
Right, so uh, remember, uh, functional disorders, those are your mental health disorders that don't really have a source. Okay, they're behavioral uh, things that develop inside the brain where uh, your organic uh, issues are secondary to things like uh, changes in the brain tissue, like Alzheimer's, or as a result of something like a traumatic brain injury. Okay, when assessing a patient with a behavioral crisis, your primary concern must be Right, that's D, okay, so we're always uh, most concerned with the patient will cause harm to us or our partner. That's pretty much uh, our primary concern anytime we go on a call, but this is especially important when dealing with uh, patients in behavioral crisis. General guidelines to follow when caring for a patient with a behavioral crisis include all of the following except... Right. Remember, uh, this is one of those things where a true behavioral crisis, unless they have some sort of uh, medical condition on top of it, generally uh, does not require rapid transport. This is much more of a uh, talk to your patient, uh, provide reassurance, make sure everything is slow and deliberate uh, to make sure that you're not... Um, uh, scaring or uh, stressing your patient out any more than they need to be. So generally, they never require emergent transport. So reflective listening, we didn't really talk on this uh, too much. This was, I think, in the communication uh, uh, section. But remember, reflective listening um, is uh, kind of understanding their information and repeating it in a question form. Uh, this kind of uh, allows you to tell the patient that you are actually listening to them by taking the information, thinking about it, and then asking more questions to further clarify their thoughts. So uh, really, uh, I found that when dealing with patients with uh, psychiatric problems or behavioral issues, the more questions you ask them, uh, the better your interaction uh, becomes. Because not only do they feel like you are invested in their actual problem, but you're also taking their mind away from whatever their issue may be and allowing them to talk about something else, allowing them to focus on something else. Okay, which of the following patients is at highest risk for suicide? 
right? Um, so obviously owning a gun does not necessarily make you more likely to commit suicide. However, coupled with uh, the alcoholism, you start getting concerned that maybe, hey, there's something going on there. Um, all of the other ones, uh, there's obvious reasons why the patient would not be suicidal. So C is really the best answer. Okay, when caring for a patient with an emotional crisis who is calm and not in need of immediate emergency care, your best course of action is... Right. Uh, take a moment, attempt to obtain consent, talk to your patient. Um, chances are, if you've been called to a scene for an emotional uh, issue, we never really want to leave those patients alone or in, in trusted uh, with a family member. Just because there's a reason why you've been called, something has escalated, so we're always going to try and insist on the patient getting evaluated. So that's why B isn't necessarily the greatest answer. Um, so C is basically the one that fits. Um, the other two are just kind of out of left field. Okay, when physically restraining a violent patient, the EMT should... Right, so anytime uh, we perform a procedure and restraining a patient is performing a procedure, we need to thoroughly explain the procedure. Okay, even if uh, this seems kind of uh, backwards, if your patient needs to be restrained, you still need to treat them with dignity and uh, the uh, respect of explaining the process and letting them uh, know what's going on, even as you continuously uh, try to restrain them to your cot. Okay, upon arrival at the residence of a young male with an apparent emotional crisis, a police officer tells you that the man is acting bizarrely. You find him sitting on his couch. He is conscious but confused. He takes medications but cannot remember why. His skin pale and diaphoretic, and he has noticeable tremors to his hands. You should first rule out... Right, so this is another one of those really good National Registry uh, type questions. They give you a lot of different information to try and lead you down a certain path. But what you really need to remember and what this is really trying to ask you is what do you think is going to kill this patient first or what do you think you need to address first? Remember, suicidal thoughts, depression, schizophrenia, none of those will actually immediately kill your patient. They don't present a true medical problem. However, hypoglycemia, as we know, 
uh, if left untreated, can cause severe mental uh, issues within only a couple of minutes and lead to coma and death. So hypoglycemia, true medical emergency, so we need to rule that out first and then start to focus on some of the other things that might not be such a hazard. Okay, which of the following signs is least indicative for a patient's potential for violence? Right, so just because the patient's big and tall doesn't mean that uh, they are any more likely to commit violence than uh, the 18-year-old uh, teenage high school girl that uh, just broke up with her boyfriend. Okay, somebody's physical size does not dictate their uh, uh, level or their potential for violence. However, all three of those other things are clear indicators uh, that somebody could uh, potentially become violent, so we need to uh, keep those in mind. All right, uh, so that's the end of the first half of tonight's lecture. Uh, let's take a 14 minute break. We'll meet back here at 45 uh, past the hour and pick up with OBGYN emergencies. <laughs>
All right, uh, we'll finish off tonight with uh, the gynecological emergencies chapter. Um, this is one of the shorter chapters, so it shouldn't take us too long. So in this chapter, uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is recognition and management of shock associated with vaginal bleeding. Uh, it's just like bleeding from anywhere else on the body, and really uh, the treatment as an EMT basic is going to be pretty much the same. Uh, some of the other things that we will just touch briefly on are uh, sexual uh, assault and how to manage uh, those types of situations. Um, and then we will touch very briefly on infections, but that's not something that there's going to be a lot of BLS care involved with. So as we know, uh, women are uniquely designed to conceive and give birth, and that therefore they are susceptible to a number of problems that do not occur in men. The female reproductive system uh, includes both internal and external structures. You can uh, review the structures in the book if you need further guidance. So the internal structures, uh, the ovaries, are the primary female reproductive uh, organ. Ovaries lie on each side uh, of the lower abdomen and produce an ovum on a one-month uh, cycle. A fetus uh, is uh, developed anytime uh, an ovum is fertilized with uh, the male sperm. The fallopian tubes connect each ovary with the uterus, uh, and the uterus is where that fertilized egg will implant itself uh, for the nine-month period of uh, gestation of a newborn. Okay, the narrowest part of uh, the uterus is the cervix, uh, which opens into the vagina. The vagina is the outermost cavity of the woman's reproductive system, and it forms the lower uh, portion of the birth canal. So it's important that we uh, understand uh, the anatomy and physiology of this, uh, really when it comes to talking about pregnancy and the OB section in the later of the book, or later chapters of the book, it's important that we understand uh, the difference between an ovary, a fallopian tube, and the uh, uh, uterus itself. Um, there are uh, complications that occur in the fallopian tubes, or if an egg gets lodged in the wrong spot, uh, that can lead to life-threatening uh, medical conditions. So we'll talk more a little bit about this uh, in the OB section, but it's important that we have a general understanding of the anatomy and physiology as well. Okay, um, when a female reaches puberty, she begins to ovulate and pass uh, those eggs on a on the 30-day cycle. Um, any uh, female who um, has the ability to go through the menstrual cycle is capable of becoming pregnant. Uh, so this is really why it's so important that we start asking uh, the pregnancy question uh, for those of childbearing age, even if uh, it does seem uh, a little out of place asking that question at 14, 13 years, 13, 14, 15 years old. 
but as long as they uh, as long as the female is able to produce those eggs we need to ask about the possibility of pregnancy because it really does change the way we handle uh, those uh, certain medical conditions that we may come across okay menopause marks the end of the menstrual activity and usually occurs around age 50 each ovary produces an egg in alternating months um, if anybody needs further explanation uh, of the fertilization process uh, I'll be happy to <laughs> answer that uh, in a chat if uh, you need further guidance okay if uh, fertilization of an egg does not occur uh, within about 14 days of ovulation the lining of the uterus begins to separate um, this process is controlled uh, by the female hormones So the uh, causes of OBGYN emergencies are very varied, ranging from uh, sexually transmitted disease to trauma. Uh, as an EMT basic, we have to have uh, the ability to recognize and properly manage uh, any kind of abdominal or pelvic pain, and especially when uh, those types of issues lead to shock. So we'll talk just a little bit about infection here. There's not a lot that concerns us from a critical care or from a uh, EMS standpoint. Um, but just like any other uh, part of the body, infections uh, can occur in the organs of reproduction, uh, the uterus, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes. Um, Generally, this occurs due to sexual activity. Uh, the real problem uh, when dealing with um, PID or any other sort of uh, inflammatory disease, we really start worrying about uh, the risk of atopic pregnancies or uh, some future inability to become pregnant. Remember, uh, or an atopic pregnancy going back to uh, the A and P slide is when uh, an egg gets fertilized and attaches into the fallopian tube and not into the cervix itself. So the fallopian tube is, you know, uh, not designed to house a uh, growing fetus. So at some point, uh, when that uh, egg gets large enough it can cause a rupture of that fallopian tube which then leads to life-threatening internal bleeding so really where we concern get concerned about um, some of these infections and the things that they cause it's not something that needs to be acutely uh, addressed but it does set uh, the patient up for complications further on down the line Um, if an infection expands uh, to the fallopian tubes, uh, it can cause scarring. Uh, as a result, that scarring can result in an increased risk of sterility. Um, if the infection uh, passes through those fallopian tubes and into the ovaries. It can also uh, cause uh, the development of abscesses or uh, infection of the actual ovary itself. And if those were to rupture again, uh, that would lead to a life-threatening infection in the abdominal cavity and could also lead to life-threatening bleeding. So uh, while the infections uh, themselves aren't necessarily something that's going to mass manifest themselves as a medical condition, the things that they lead to uh, 
uh, can uh, definitely cause some problems. Okay, uh, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, okay, uh, these can lead to more serious conditions. Um, when we think of sexually transmitted diseases, uh, some of them have relatively benign and easily treatable uh, signs and symptoms, whereas uh, some of them can re be really life-changing and impossible to treat, such as hepatitis or HIV. Uh, chlamydia is the most common STD in uh, the United States. It's caused by a bacteria and can be treated uh, via an antibiotic, so not something that uh, is truly uh, a lifelong concern, but if left untreated, uh, the symptoms can progress and once again lead to reproductive problems further on down the line. Okay, uh, bacterial vaginosis. This is uh, an abnormal uh, bacterial growth in the vagina. Once again, this is caused by bacteria and can be uh, treated with uh, antibiotics. Once again, uh, if left untreated, can uh, cause problems with reproductive issues such as premature birth or low birth weight if the patient is pregnant. Okay, gonorrhea, uh, this is another bacterial infection. This one uh, is a little bit more dangerous than the other ones. Um, can grow and uh, multiply rapidly in warm, moist areas of the reproductive tract. Uh, this includes both men and women. If left untreated, uh, this can actually enter the bloodstream and spread to other parts of the body, making you septic. Uh, these bacteria can also grow in other areas of the body, such as the mouth, the throat, and the eyes. Okay, severe infections, uh, when we start to get concerned, cramping and abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Um, if untreated, like I said, it can even infect the brain uh, and cause sepsis. So moving on from infections, we'll talk about some bleeding here. Uh, bleeding may be considered uh, menstrual bleeding and overlooked. However, there are things that cause vaginal bleeding that can truly be a life-threatening uh, emergency. Uh, things like atopic pregnancy, spontaneous abortion. Uh, we can see cancer uh, manifest themselves uh, in this manner. So uh, it's important to do a uh, thorough assessment uh, using your clinical judgment to try and determine whether or not uh, this is normal and uh, or if this is a sign of uh, a more severe problem. Now when I say it's important that we do a thorough ass assessment I mean uh, that using your uh, assessment skills, not, this is not a physical exam, this is using your deductive reasoning skills to gather a good uh, history of the patient. Um, most people can tell you if this is normal menstrual bleeding or if there is something abnormal going on. And really where we get concerned is uh, is the patient displaying signs of shock? Okay, remember, uh, normal menstrual bleeding should not produce any physiological changes. Um, if you are uh, seeing a patient that has having vaginal bleeding and they're pale, diaphoretic, 
uh, hypotensive. Okay, that is true life-threatening bleeding and not associated with menstrual uh, bleeding. So you need to uh, take that as a severe internal hemorrhage and treat it just like you would anybody else who is going into hypovolemic shock. Okay, obtaining an accurate and detailed assessment is critical. You'll be able to uh, gain only a primary impression of the problem in the field. Thorough patient assessment will help determine how sick the patient is and whether life-saving measures are needed. So, uh, just like any other patient, uh, scene safety is going to be key. Um, generally, uh, if this is a true uh, gynecological emergency, uh, it can involve large amounts of blood and bodily fluids. So we need to uh, make sure that we are taking really good uh, body substance isolation. Um, Involve the police if assault is expected. Like I said, the end of this chapter really deals with uh, how to respond to sexual assaults. So uh, that's why that is in there. Uh, it is important to have a female EMT provide care if possible in the setting of a sexual assault. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important in a couple slides. Okay, just like any other call, our scene size up starts with our dispatch information. Hopefully we can try and get a good idea of what's going on before we get there. Uh, evaluate your need for additional resources. Obviously, if there's an assault taking place, uh, the police department needs to be dispatched as well. With our primary assessment, it's the same as any other patient. You're going to want to form a general impression. Is the patient stable or unstable? Okay, we're going to use the AVPU scale to develop or to determine their level of consciousness. And then we're going to evaluate their airway and breathing by always evaluating uh, and ensuring an adequate airway. Circulation, remember here we are uh, looking for life-threatening blood loss, evaluating pulse and skin color, uh, temperature and moisture to help uh, determine whether or not the patient is in shock. Keep in mind, most gynecological emergencies are not life-threatening. However, if the patient has signs of shock, rapid transport is going to be warranted. Signs of shock, weak rapid pulse, poor skin signs, uh, then you're obviously going to transport this patient and emergently. However, most of the time we're going to move on into uh, our history taking. We're going to focus on the chief complaint. Keep in mind that some of these questions are extremely personal, personal so make sure that you're uh, providing appropriate privacy and uh, dignity when uh, performing an assessment. Okay, an abdominal pain. Uh, abdominal pain is going to be uh, associated generally with most OBGYN problems. Remember uh, our assessment points from uh, the abdominal pain section. We're going to ask about onset, duration, quality, and radiation, uh, your OPQRST, any associated symptoms such as syncope, uh, you know, passing out losing consciousness, lightheadedness, nausea, vomiting, and fever. Okay, for vaginal bleeding, we want to uh, ask about the onset. So when did it occur? How long it is, has it been going on? Um, when did it start occurring? What were you doing? Okay, you want to try and determine the quantity. Uh, the, and the way, way we measure this in medicine is the number of sanitary pads used over a time period, and then associated symptoms such as syncope and lightheadedness. Okay, sample history. Uh, just like any other patient, note allergies and current medications. Uh, it's important to ask about birth control or other contraceptive devices. Ask about um, 
their last menstrual period, any exposure to STDs, and obviously if there is any chance that they may or uh, may be pregnant. Okay, secondary assessment. Um, make sure that you're doing a full head to toe. This should include vital signs, uh, palpation of the abdomen. Uh, you might have to check for any visible bleeding. However, uh, use your discretion and provide uh, as much uh, privacy as you can. Generally, uh, I will ask if there is any active bleeding um, that is uh, more than sufficient and evaluate their neurological mental status. Talking about physical examinations, physical examinations should be limited and professional, protect a woman's privacy, limit the number of personnel uh, present, focus your physical examination on the nature of illness and patient's chief complaint. Okay, so uh, this is not something that we generally deal with on a daily basis, especially uh, if the provider is of the opposite sex. Remember, your physical examinations uh, should really, there's really no reason to put hands on. There's really no reason to uh, perform direct uh, visualization. Okay. All we're really concerned about is, is their life-threatening bleeding occurring, and you can ask the patient that question. The only time that you uh, should ever have to perform an exact physical examination uh, is when uh, we're concerned about an imminent delivery, and we need to check and see if there is any part of a fetus present at the vaginal opening. Outside of that, there is really no reason to perform a physical uh, examination of anybody's uh, private regions, whether male or female, and uh, especially there should be no reason why we would ever uh, place our hands or fingers inside of somebody else's body uh, that is just never medically acceptable. So uh, use discretion. Everybody's smart enough here to figure out what you should and what you should not be doing. Generally, your patient is a good enough historian to provide you what is going on with their body. Okay, if there is life-threatening bleeding present, uh, it may be necessary to visualize the bleeding. Um, we're going to uh, use external pads to control the bleeding. Once again, we're never inserting anything into the body. Okay, I can't stress that part enough. We're going to use external measures to control the bleeding. We're going to look for uh, secondary uh, issues such as uh, fever, nausea, vomiting uh, that can clue us into any sorts of infection. Okay, our vital signs, just like any other patient, heart rate, respiratory rate, skin color, cap refill time, blood pressure, and orthostatic vital signs. Remember, orthostatic vital signs, remember, is when you check the patient's blood pressure and pulse rate in three different positions, standing, sitting, and laying flat. Okay. Obviously, uh, in a healthy person, the blood pressure and pulse rate will not change between those three positions. However, if the patient has lost a lot of blood or is on the verge of shock, their blood pressure is going to be dramatically different when they are laying flat and the blood is circulating easily to the brain versus when they are standing upright. Uh, it requires a lot more force and a lot more volume. So uh, if there's a dramatic difference between laying flat and standing up as far as their vital signs, we consider that a positive orthostatic vital sign change. We don't really see that in EMS too much. That's an in-hospital thing, but that's what orthostatic vital signs are.
Okay, uh, use your pulse oximetry. Um, we've talked a little bit about this before, but with the prevalence of blood pressure machines and automated blood pressures, uh, the first blood pressure you take on a patient should always be done manually with a stethoscope and a manual blood pressure cuff. Uh, that's to ensure accuracy. Okay, then all of your subsequent uh, vital sign checks can be taken uh, on uh, your automated machines. But your first blood pressure should always be taken uh, manually. Okay, reassess the patient. Uh, we reassess the patient, a stable patient, every 15 minutes. Unstable patients, uh, we repeat every five minutes. Okay, there are very few interventions uh, for a OBGYN emergency. Really, what we are going to treat for are hyper, hypoperfusion or shock and transport promptly. So remember, our treatment for shock is giving fluids, or excuse me, not giving fluids, that's an ALS thing, is going to be giving oxygen and keeping the patient warm and transporting them in a patient uh, position of comfort. Okay. Um, communication and documentation, make sure that you are uh, relaying any possibility of pregnancy to the hospital staff and then carefully document everything, especially in cases of sexual assault, and we'll talk more about that uh, here in a couple slides. So how do we care for these patients? Big thing, maintain the privacy as much as possible. Uh, these uh, evaluations and uh, history taking should always be done inside the ambulance. If at all possible, have a female EMT attend to the patient. Remember that determining the cause of the bleeding is far less significant than treating the shock and transporting, okay? Especially in an OBGYN emergency, we don't necessarily care where the blood is coming from. There is nothing that you're going to do to stop the bleeding. What we're really concerned about is treating the shock and hypoperfusion and getting them to the hospital where they can perform the surgical interventions to stop the bleeding. Okay, continue to control the bleeding uh, with uh, sanitary pads. Um, if there is trauma, keep in mind that uh, the areas have a very rich nerve supply, so uh, that's going to make injuries very painful. Remember, we are never placing anything inside the body as an EMT basic. If there is external trauma, we're going to treat lacerations with a moist, sterile dressing. Um, use pressure to control the bleeding. And like I said, do not pack or place dressings in the vagina under any circumstances. Okay, PID. Uh, or uh, vaginal infections, pre-hospital treatment is limited, non-emergency transport and follow-up with primary care is really what these patients need. Okay, sexual assault. Um, there are many complex uh, issues uh, when dealing with uh, victims of sexual assault that we need to keep in mind. Uh, this is going to be a very uh, difficult time for the patient uh, and for you as well. Keep in mind that issues that generally arise in these situations are not only limited to medical issues, but to psychologic issues and then even legal issues uh, when uh, this comes around for prosecution. Okay, you may be the first uh, person victim has contact uh, after the encounter. How you manage the situation uh, could have lasting effects for both you and the patient. Uh, 
It's very important that we exercise professionalism, kindness, and sensitivity in these uh, difficult uh, interactions. Keep in mind that drugs uh, can be used to facilitate sexual assault or rape, so we need to make sure that uh, we are providing sound medical treatment for an overdose if necessary. Um, if the patient has the inability to remember the event, uh, that should heighten your uh, suspicion that there could be some drugs involved. Uh, these drugs that are common uh, can lead to hypotension, uh, bradycardia or low heart rate, abdominal complaints, seizures, coma, and ultimately cardiac arrest. So it's very important that we focus uh, on the life-threatening issues first, and then uh, once we've uh, addressed those, we can move on to providing uh, emotional support and uh, transport. Okay, uh, you can expect police involvement. Remember, this is something that is uh, a mandatory reporting situation. Um, so if the police are not involved, you need to go ahead and uh, request them to get them involved. Uh, we are not law enforcement officials. So it is not our job to immediately gather any details. This may only uh, cause more uh, psychological stress. So our focus is on treating the patient uh, medically and allowing the uh, police department to deal with uh, the other issues in play here. Like we've talked about, if possible, give the option of being treated uh, by a female EMT or a same-sex uh, provider, if at all possible. Okay, like I said, focus is medical treatment. Is he or she physically injured? Are there any life-threatening injuries present? Uh, does the patient complain of any pain? We need to preserve any evidence, okay? So be uh, very uh, careful when removing uh, clothing to perform an exam or to gather vital signs. Um, we shouldn't be cutting or destroying any of the clothing. And that clothing should be set aside either in a, uh, a separate bag or uh, in a manner in which that it does not become contaminated. Also, uh, we should not be allowing these patients to uh, take a shower or perform any uh, um, any cleaning. Okay, obviously, if you need to dress wounds or irrigate or anything like that, do so. However, uh, taking a shower or allowing your patient to clean is uh, not something that we should be doing. Okay, so don't cut through clothing. Do not throw anything away. Um, patient should be uh, discouraged uh, from urinating or rinsing out the mouth uh, until they've been examined at the hospital. Uh, these patients will be examined by uh, specially trained uh, nurses at the facility uh, who not who are only who are trained to not only provide the medical care and do the examinations from a legal standpoint, but they also have training in the uh, psychological aspect of it as well. And uh, like I said, one of the big things is always uh, documenting uh, effectively in these situations because more than likely your report will be turned into a legal document. Okay, uh, here's this nice table uh, to give you some more uh, in-depth explanation of the things that we just talked about. 
All right, uh, so we'll just uh, run through these here really quick. What is the narrowest portion of the uterus? Um, just so that we have a good understanding for the uh, OB section where some of these principles will be expanded upon. Right, so um, it's important to uh, know that the cervix is the narrowest portion of the uterus. That's how we uh, measure the progression of, uh, of the birth process. Okay, so as uh, the birth process progresses, the cervix becomes dilated, which then allows the fetus to pass into the birthing canal. So... Uh, when uh, a patient is checked for their progress of uh, the birthing process, they're measuring the opening of the cervix. Okay, the outermost cavity of the woman's reproductive system is the vagina. Okay, if fertilization does not occur within about blank days following ovulation, the lining of the uterus begins to separate and menstruation occurs. Right, so the entire process takes about 30 days, um, but if fertilization uh, is only possible for about 14 days of that process. Not worried about that. Okay, which of the following can cause vaginal bleeding? Right, remember, um, the thing to remember with this thing, or this presentation, is that it doesn't really matter what is causing the bleeding. As we are concerned as emergency medical providers, uh, we are focused on treating the signs and symptoms of it. So uh, we are really concerned with treating the shock. Um, there's not much that we're going to do uh, to stop the bleeding based on what is actually causing it. We can't perform surgery. So really, uh, our focus is on identifying the bleeding and then treating uh, any associated shock that may be present. I'm not worried about PID. You won't see any questions about that. When obtaining a sample history, which of the following pieces of information is important to obtain? Uh, in an OBGYN setting. Right, 
uh, it's D, all of the above. It's important that we determine all of uh, this information to help pass on to the hospital so that we ensure that the patient receives uh, proper care. Obviously, the most important is going to be the possibility of pregnancy because uh, that can lead to the most life-threatening uh, situations associated with gynecological emergencies. Okay, what is the EMT's first priority when dealing with a patient experiencing excessive vaginal bleeding? Right, treat the patient for shock, and if they are in shock, transport them emergently so they can seek definitive care. Okay, which of the following drugs is commonly used to facilitate sexual assault? We didn't talk about this, uh, but it's uh, rohifenol or Rufi's. Uh, it's a sedative uh, most uh, commonly found in veterinary medicine. Uh, to facilitate uh, like surgical sedation. Um, there is no place for it really in uh, human medicine, but it causes all of those things that we talked about, hypotension, uh, bradycardia, it can depress the respiratory uh, effort and eventually lead to cardiac arrest. Okay, uh, and you should discourage a rape or sexual assault victim from doing which of the following? Right, all of the above, all of these things could potentially destroy evidence, um, so we want to uh, try and discourage uh, that as much as possible. Now that doesn't mean that you should forcibly or not allow, if they are set on doing any one of these things, um, you should just try and explain why it would not be ideal. However, um, we allow our patients to make their own choices, so uh, it's not something that they can't do. All right, uh, that's it for the medical section of our class. Uh, this is the section that has the most uh, in-depth uh, information to understand. It's also the thing that is most foreign to people uh, when they get into emergency medicine. So if you've made it through this far, if you're feeling comfortable, uh, congratulations. The class is easy and downhill from here. Like I said, next Tuesday, uh, it's an exam night. We will show up at uh, 6 o'clock. I will take the attendance and then you guys will have the remainder of the evening to uh, work on your quizzes and exams. Um, I will also answer any questions you have about uh, this section or review anything uh, that you would like me to before we sign off uh, on Tuesday night. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll hang out for a little bit. Feel free to type them in the box. Otherwise, have a good night. That's all I have. We'll see you next week. Have a good one.